So, um, hello everyone. My name is Marco Campi and uh, I really take pleasure in uh, taking part uh, uh, in this uh, summer school uh, jointly organized by APFL and uh, ATH. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for putting this up. And um, there are two very good friends of mine here. Uh, one is uh, John Ligueros, the other one is Daniel Kuhn. Uh, who are part of the organization, I would like uh, to uh, thank and greet them. And then uh, to be a suitor, another very good friend of mine who first contacted me asking whether I wanted to uh, take part in the school and I enthusiastically said yes immediately because uh, the uh, topics covered in the school uh, are really in line uh, with what has been my main interests over the past uh, uh, 15 years. Also, I would like to uh, thank all the other organizers. I have a list here. So, uh, voter John Genil, Matilde Garjani, Angeliki uh, Camuzzi, Clara Galimberti, and Bai uh, Weigu. I believe that this school is quite timely uh, for reasons that I'm going to explain uh, um, during my presentation. So coming to uh, my, my talk today, uh, I'd like to say that it is uh, split in two parts. The first one will be given using a, a whiteboard. So I'm going to uh, tell you something of my vision about data-driven controller opportunities and challenges. Uh, that will uh, will uh, uh, be uh, part of the future of uh, our community. So I'm going to use a, a, just a pen. I have a um, graphic tablet in front of me. So I jot down some sentences, but particularly I spend much time just uh, trying to deliver my uh, vision. Uh, then I will move to the second part which is more about my own research over the past 15 years. And the, this is the uh, scenario approach. And the first part, uh, we also paved the way to uh, the presentation of the second part. So I'm organized here with two screens. Let me put uh, myself uh, on the left. Uh, and uh, I would like to switch to this configuration so you can see me in the bottom left uh, and uh, and uh, uh, you can also see my uh, whiteboard so on top of blue you see just the uh, title of the school and then uh, uh, there is my name and this is the title the overall title of my uh, talk data driven decision making and the scenario approach so this uh, covers both parts, the first uh, part uh, with the whiteboard and the second part uh, about the scenario approach with the uh, slides. So uh, the first part uh, is uh, in turn uh, split uh, in uh, two uh, chapters. So number one uh, uh, I would like to uh, title uh, the new challenge where I'll try to sketch my vision uh, as far as the uh, era of data and the opportunities and the challenges in this era are uh, and then I will move to the second chapter, which is the tools. Which means that we need to be armed to address the new challenges. And again, I will try to uh, convey to you some of my vision about the tools we have. And this allow me uh, also to focus on the scenario approach as a specific methodology, but broad enough uh, to, I hope, be of interest uh, uh, for you uh, that will cover in the second part. So let me start with the, the uh, new uh, challenge. 
so I would like to be a bit order here so I rewrite the title for you so I would like to start by saying that uh, we really live in the era of data so this is a uh, an important key sentence in this presentation, era of data, which comes with a lot of opportunities, but also with plenty of challenges. Uh, networks of sensors are everywhere in, in the environment, and they provide us with the, uh, plenty of data points in a reliable uh, uh, and cheap way and uh, on top of that uh, we are uh, witnessing a, an increase in the computational power which is uh, the other extra element that really uh, matters in the story so we collect all these data and we have to process them and uh, when uh, uh, moving to conferences not just in the field of control but also nearby fields, I have noticed that uh, topics like large-scale optimization, for example, are getting pervasive. So uh, we collect data, we have to process them, eh? and uh, the uh, computational power to do that uh, is uh, another important uh, driving technology in the story. Concurrently, the applications our community is looking at uh, has been changing through time. And nowadays, uh, we have in front of us uh, applications that uh, were not uh, uh, considered in the past. And uh, simultaneously, we are also reshaping uh, uh, traditional fields uh, where control has played a role uh, for many years. So uh, this is important because uh, this uh, poses new challenges uh, and in particular one aspect that plays a significant role in this story is that uh, these applications refer to systems uh, and systems of systems uh, of increasing complexity. So I would like just to uh, make this uh, a bit more concrete by referring to two or three examples uh, uh, that partly come from my own experience uh, I have absolutely no, uh, uh, I make no claim of completeness here. So this just, uh, these are just some of uh, uh, the examples uh, among uh, 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 many more possibilities. One is uh, the field of uh, automotive. In these fields, uh, there are emerging uh, applications uh, involving uh, large-scale systems uh, and a lot of data points. Uh, let me just mention two examples in the automotive sector. One is uh, intelligent freeways. So I remember being in California in the Silicon Valley some years ago and for the first time I bumped into this uh, system of coordinated ramp signals which means that uh, at the time you try to merge onto the freeway there, you are stopped by a signal uh, that can be red or green, and there are deployed uh, on the uh, network uh, sensors uh, that are collecting information about uh, the level of traffic in the different portions of the freeway. These are brought to uh, a central unit uh, that is, uh, is uh, uh, giving uh, uh, you uh, green light or red light uh, depending on whether uh, there is a forecast for uh, congestions or not. So they are regulating the system. So this is one, one example where there are a lot of sensors distributed data processed in real time uh, and then uh, there is a control action which is uh, the light in the uh, signals uh, at the different and the various ramps uh, for entering the freeway. Another uh, example which is very well known to everyone I believe is that of uh, automatic vehicles uh, that move around in our roads uh, and uh, you can imagine that there are uh, incredible control problems there 
uh, because uh, there are so many challenges. For example, this vehicle had autonomously to avoid the obstacles. And these are not fixed obstacles. There can be a passerby that perhaps disappear behind the tree and uh, you need to forecast the fact that later it will appear on the other side and so you have to take all this under consideration. So the automotive field is really an emerging field where a lot of uh, uh, new interesting problems uh, using a lot of data and data-driven technology uh, is, uh, is, uh, is present in this field. Another one where I've done uh, research myself uh, is uh, power, uh, let me say generation and uh, dispatchment. Uh, So traditionally, the generation of power was done with the conventional plants, uh, but uh, nowadays we are moving towards uh, a uh, larger penetration of uh, uh, renewables. I'm particularly referring here to wind and the solar energy that comes with a lot of uncertainty, requiring in turn the use of uh, uh, data. So when uh, when we talk of uh, solar energy, for example, uh, uh, it's quite clear that uh, the production uh, is uh, largely affected by the weather conditions. So if a cloud is going to cover your uh, solar panel, then the uh, production of energy drops down to zero, or close to zero. So again, a lot of data distributed systems uh, and uh, the necessity to coordinate actions uh, to, uh, to uh, make uh, the um, functioning of the overall system uh, smooth uh, and, uh, and uh, in line with the, what the uh, goals uh, uh, are. So uh, this is a second filter and uh, even one more that I'd like to mention is uh, medical, uh, medical applications. Uh, where again, uh, we are using more and more data. Uh, so the, 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 the examples I might give you here are very many. Let me just pick one. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, uh, inspection of skin spots to determine whether they are uh, benign or malignant tumors. And you know that uh, now there are uh, automated systems where you take an image of the skin and this is going to classify the spots and this is likely to become a widely available technology to all the smartphone customer users in the near future. So uh, this is the new world. A lot of uh, applications, uh, complex systems, uh, uh, real-time uh, uh, data collection, uh, uh, grids of uh, sensors, uh, and so on and so forth. On top of, the, of all this, and uh, in relation to all these uh, applications, uh, there is one more fact that uh, deserves to be explicitly mentioned. And it is, uh, uh, data have always been used. Take, for example, a medical application. You test the patient, uh, then uh, the uh, medical doctor collects the information. But the point is that in the past there was, there was more human intervention. So that is a posteriori, the final decision was left with the human being that was responsible for uh, an, uh, an, uh, a final decision and uh, uh, for an informed decision. In the new uh, world, uh, uh, we are experiencing that, that data are used more and more directly in the loop. So I would like to, to write this because that's important. So we are experiencing data driven in the loop. Uh, 
let me say technologies or technology and uh, that that's important because uh, when uh, a data driven technology is uh, directly operating in the loop uh, then uh, it becomes very urgent that uh, this technology is equipped with uh, a good theory and we are scientists and we have the duty to provide this new world uh, with the good theories so i was particularly thrilled by the uh, uh, name given to this uh, summer school which i have here again on my left foundations and the mathematical guarantees of data-driven control because they, uh, the focus is on mathematical guarantees which i believe is very very important for the future of all these technologies so it's not just uh, you know kind of having a melting pot where you put uh, inside the some uh, standard methods uh, you uh, put inside the new uh, data point stance coming from uh, uh, sensors and then you stir so uh, I believe that uh, it is time to step back uh, to look at this world uh, and to try to uh, build uh, the new the new science for uh, the data driven technology and this demands uh, a lot of uh, inspection deep inspection in the problems uh, and the analysis uh, and not just the use of data per se because this is not uh, uh, enough for uh, for all these uh, uh, applications so uh, this is important uh, and uh, I was very thrilled when uh, I was contacted to give talk, a talk here at uh, the summer school because this is really in line with my own research I've been uh, striving uh, over the past 15 years uh, to uh, trying to uh, put together a new uh, theory or theoretical framework uh, at least in the given uh, subfield uh, of the story uh, in the guarantees uh, is a central issue and the other try to convey something of this in the second part uh, which is about the scenario the scenario approach uh, now having said so let me uh, draw a line here i would like to put forward to put on the table one more concept which I believe is a very, very important. So I would like to draw a box for you. And in this box, I write designer. So designer, this is a box that contains an algorithm that makes a design. A design of what? Or whatever, depends on the application. So the output can be a model, can be a controller, can be a predictor. So here we have uh, on the right uh, an arrow and uh, this points to design. So again, uh, design can be uh, have a, uh, the, 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 the freeway uh, control problem that uh, I told you of before and you would like to design a suitable con distributed control uh, a policy for that or anything else now uh, in uh, the present or the current years uh, a design is based basically on various sources of information that we can uh, group uh, in two different categories on the left here we have data data come to us and uh, we would like to make the most of them data normally refer to first hand information relating to the problem at hand but uh, coming from the other side uh, there is also much more something that I call prior knowledge So what's prior knowledge? Prior knowledge is uh, all knowledge 
that comes from uh, things that we have acquired before the specific application at hand. So prior knowledge may refer to a physical law. I have an object in front of me and uh, I would like to describe it to come up with a suitable design. So a physical law is prior knowledge applied specifically to uh, the context I have in mind here. But prior knowledge can also uh, refer to more specific contents that relate to the problem at hand in one way or another way. And uh, interestingly, the uh, community of control uh, uh, has uh, been relying on prior knowledge by and large until now. So uh, traditionally, uh, if a, a controller uh, person is asked to design a controller for an engine, for example, or uh, a mechanical system, the traditional approach is uh, the uh, mechanical uh, system is uh, inspected, uh, one uh, drives a model, the model of that uh, uh, mechanical system, and then based on the model, the controller is designed. So this is the uh, traditional workflow. And uh, we do not want to give this up. That is, prior knowledge is important, uh, physical laws, and so on and so forth. However, on top of that, uh, now we have a lot of data we, want, we would like to make use of. And this is important because if we look at the new application endeavors as given for example in this slide by the blue uh, fields automotive power generation uh, medical application and so on we see that we are well beyond traditional applications like uh, the control of a motor so these are complex systems and the prior knowledge is uh, often not enough so we cannot hope to a priori uh, model everything and then uh, uh, use this knowledge uh, to make a design. So data become uh, an important ingredient in this story. And very importantly, so here I would like to make a point that is, uh, I think, uh, uh, central in this story. Data and the prior knowledge uh, are having different levels of, uh, of uh, sureness. Of, uh, so uh, we cannot trust uh, the same these two sources of information in many applications. Data often refer to uh, first-hand information coming to us for the application at hand, whereas prior knowledge may or may not refer to something that we know for sure. And very often in complex applications, prior knowledge refers to uh, uncertain knowledge that uh, we still want to use uh, to improve our design. So I understand that the others can be a bit vague. So uh, let me give you a simple example of this uh, dichotomy, data and the prior knowledge. And uh, then I will tell you why I believe that uh, why I believe uh, this dichotomy is a uh, is uh, important uh, in the uh, story that I've traced so far. So let me give you an example uh, of this uh, two sources of information. So uh, example. Uh, And my example is a medical application. So, say that we can give a patient uh, a medical inspection. And uh, in this uh, axis, I'm going to put the outcome of this uh, medical inspection. So it's a number, can be here, can be here, can be there. 
and uh, on the y-axis I put the degree of a, some disease degree of disease and uh, I would like to construct a predictor or an estimator which means that tomorrow a new patient comes here you give this patient uh, the medical inspection and you say okay you are here and then you would like to evaluate the degree of the disease and for doing so assume that uh, we have uh, we have seen previous cases what uh, we call a training set and the, each previous case has associated two numbers the outcome of the medical inspection but we also know the exact degree of the disease for example the exact degree can be obtained by an invasive procedure that we do not want to uh, give uh, uh, to everyone so by the invasive procedure you know the degree of the disease and also you give the medical inspection and you know the outcome so in other words uh, we have previous cases uh, like one here for example having uh, this result for the medical inspection and this degree of the disease and uh, say that uh, we have uh, a training set so many of this this can be one this can be another one another one another one another one and so on so these are the data so in red let me make again the uh, box and this box, uh, box is the one for making the design and the arrow coming from the left in this uh, simple example are the data so let me say uh, let me put crosses so these are the data then you would like to construct a predictor and uh, I mean this example is really a toy example that you can inspect visually which is not always the case so prior information can be important when constructing a predictor and to say that you know a colleague next door in your university has uh, undergone a similar uh, problem last year so uh, you just go knock at his door and you ask uh, do you have any advice to give me about the type of predictor I should use in this application and this guy says oh, oh I have extensively Made, uh, studied a similar problem and uh, it turned out that uh, a good predictor was uh, a linear uh, relation between uh, the medical inspection and the degree of disease uh, well uh, are you sure you may ask are you sure about what you are saying and this, the, the, the suggestion the hint you are giving me and they say that this guy says well I'm quite sure but I cannot give you full confidence in that because you know the disease that I was studied is, was not exactly the same as yours but it was very similar so in other words say that uh, you get here a prior advice uh, use linear a linear correlation between uh, the two then you go back to your office and of course you are puzzled should I or should I not use uh, this uh, extra information and listen this is uh, always the case so uh, we have uh, information that comes to us uh, uh, some information is a first hand data other information is that as a uh, uh, extra knowledge that we acquire and we are not completely sure about and the the question is whether we want just to ditch or discard this extra information because uh, uh, it doesn't come with a, a certificate for being a 100 percent guaranteed to be correct and i believe that uh, our answer is no i don't want to ditch this information because uh, 
This can be very important to me. Hence, in the new world, we need to construct theories able to put together in a very sound and scientific manner different sources of information. Information having different levels of uh, or different certificates uh, of being correct. So let me explain with this example. I may want to construct uh, a layer for this uh, example that uh, contains uh, all data points. So uh, as is obvious, uh, if I use this layer for prediction, I want this layer to be as thin as possible because then my prediction becomes more informative. But at the same time, I want my layer, say, to be consistent with the data points. So I construct the thinnest layer containing all data points. And tomorrow, I, oops, sorry, tomorrow I give uh, uh, the medical inspection to the new a guy, I go up here and I say, okay, the level of your disease is uh, in here. So I care about the width of the layer because uh, the uh, thinner the layer, the more informative the information I get from my model. And here my message to you comes. The width depends only on the design, on what you have constructed the layer. So this is a, this is a known, visible, uh, let me say, this is a known at the end of the procedure. That is, you use the data, you accept the advice of your colleague, you construct a linear layer, so a layer centered around the linear line and then you say okay the width is this much so this can be good or not good for you doesn't matter but this is something that you see what you do not see is uh, the probability with which your prediction will be wrong because you've seen just a few guys from a population and uh, you can expect that uh, someone will be sitting above or below and if happens that the guy uh, in blue to whom you have given the medical inspection uh, is, uh, is in here, let me make a red spot for you, so outside the layer, so your uh, layer for prediction uh, makes a mistake on that guy, then this can be bad because you make a prediction and you say, okay, uh, you go home the degree of your disease uh, is not that bad for you to be worried about. And instead the guy was sitting above. So I call the probability for this to happen the risk. And what really matters to me is that uh, this is a not known uh, or let me say not inspectable, not computable even a posteriori. So you can start your layer using prior information, using data, and then there is a risk for out of sample cases for a new patient, and the risk is not computable. And this is where we need to have good theories. Theories is certifying the level of risk. And here I have a message for you. We need to strive for uh, theories uh, that hold true as generally as possible. And particularly, this theory certifying the risk uh, should maintain their validity when an unsure prior turns out to be incorrect. I want to write this for you. So the theory, the theory certifying the risk should maintain its validity 
even when the prior is incorrect. I know it sounds hard, but I believe that this is possible. We need to exploit data in a suitable manner so as we make this possible. And then you may become a bit nervous here and say, okay, but what's the role of the prior? If the certification for the risk remains valid even when the prior is wrong. Well, the prior plays a fundamental role. But my message to you is that the prior should only impact the visible part. Let me write this as well. The prior should only impact the... I don't want to change the uh, adjective here, so I've written known before. Um, let me see the inspectable part. Which in the example at hand is the width. Some, the width, something I can measure once I have constructed the layer. So, say that the prior, just to carry on this example a bit further, say that the prior is uh, incorrect. So the guy next door was wrong. And the linear model falls short uh, of uh, providing a good uh, a correlation uh, between uh, the two, the two uh, variables. So say that data points uh, are uh, something like this. Again, uh, here you see because uh, this is in two dimensions, uh, this is a toy example for you to understand. But uh, this is not always the case. So if you take a look at this, you see that the data have a curvy pattern. Uh, uh, so, but despite this, uh, you use the uh, colleague's advice uh, and you make uh, a linear model like this. So if so, you're left with a lot of empty space here, here, and importantly, what you see is that uh, the width becomes large. So what I'm telling you is that prior knowledge should be used at a time you set out how to solve the problem, how to make your design. And this should have a final impact on the outcome of the design at the level that is visible or inspectable. The theory certifying the robustness or guaranteeing the risk underlying your procedure should hold true despite the incorrectness uh, or the possible incorrectness uh, of uh, some prior knowledge that uh, you are using. And I believe this is very important uh, in, the, uh, in the future uh, challenges because uh, more and more when it comes to complex systems we are trying methodologies uh, kind of incorporating uh, prior knowledge of different sorts, uh, hints, uh, ideas, uh, well, we do not have to trust this and still we want to use it. So the theory should remain valid even when this is not correct. And the, the later in uh, the second hour, I will be really uh, focusing on this and uh, mm, I will try to convey the idea that this is possible. Data contain much more information than what traditional methods are able to exploit and there is a, a possibility to construct a new scientific framework for making this possible. Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to tell you about the challenges of the situation here of data, but uh, I mean, time flies. Uh, I also have uh, my second uh, uh, well, chapter, and the second chapter was the tools. So, what are the tools we have in our hands? Uh, not much. 
not much. Uh, and there is, a, again, a message I would like to convey to you. And the message is that uh, uh, one fundamental tool to me is probability theory. Because uh, in the new challenges with data, complex world, uh, we need to keep under control the risk and the uncertainty. And when it comes to risk and uncertainty, the uh, flexible, uh, well-developed uh, and quite powerful tool is called probability theory. So uh, probability theory plays uh, a central role in, uh, in this story. However, if you look at traditional results in probability theory, most of them are of asymptotic nature. I'm referring here to things like the strong law of large numbers. Strong law of large numbers. I'm referring here to the central limit theorem. I've done a lot of research myself in the field of uh, system identification, which is part of, you know, the uh, control uh, uh, community, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the system identification community is part of the control community. And uh, in this field, the uh, asymptotics uh, from probability theory are used a lot. Uh, but again, we are in the new world. And this, again, falls short uh, of providing good answers. Let me explain you my, uh, what I see here, my idea. So, if you use uh, asymptotic results, uh, you are assuming that the number of data points here n, n is the number of data points, number of data points, uh, oops, sorry, number of data points uh, is large. So asymptotics means uh, uh, the number of data points tends to infinity. Of course, if it is large enough, well, we are engineers, say, and we say, okay, that's large enough for uh, using the uh, asymptotic result. But large with respect to what? So there is a numerator in this, uh, in this story, and the numerator is the complexity of the problem at hand. So just to make uh, this quite imprecise, but uh, just to jot down some uh, expression, I would like to put the cardinality of theta. Theta is the vector that we are designing. It can be the, 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 the uh, parameters in a control design, can be uh, the uh, how many coefficients you use uh, in a predictor, and so on and so forth. So large means that uh, this ratio, this ratio here must be small. And again, in the new uh, era of data-driven methods and complex applications, uh, one might say, one might say, okay, uh, you told us we got a lot of uh, data points, so asymptotics is, is really applicable. Well, no, uh, in many applications, this does not happen. And this is because uh, as the denominator here gets bigger, also the numerator gets bigger. In the uh, nowadays applications, uh, this often happens. Let me give an example. Say that, uh, very, very simply, say that uh, you come to me and you give me 1,000 data points uh, in a classification problem. So this is a... Uh, Oops, this is a, a training set that I use to construct a classify. I go home and uh, probably with 1000 data points, I construct a classifier using a, a class uh, which is uh, small enough, not, not too complex. So in other words, uh, I try to keep uh, 
the cardinality of theta, so the size of what I train, not too large. Tomorrow, you come back to me and say, listen, now I have a big wealth of information for you. So instead of 1,000, I have 100,000 data points. What do I do? So do I keep the same structure for my uh, classifier? Or do I move on and uh, I become greedy and I increase the structure? The point is that for complex problems, there is always what we call bias. That is, if we take a small structure, no matter how well we choose from that structure, we are still away from the optimal solution. So as you provide me with more data points, I try to enlarge the structure so that uh, so that I can get closer to the optimal solution. So and this is a uh, very often the case uh, in uh, in uh, many application uh, setups. So as the number of data points increase, also theta increases. And hence uh, asymptotics do not apply. So I believe that the new science of data-driven methodologies should uh, target the goal of uh, studying what I call finite sample results. Finite sample results. So let's stay away from assuming that n tends to infinity. I mean, this is not uh, uh, quite true, especially in the, in the present applications. So uh, I know that uh, uh, it's, all this is a bit frightening because uh, I'm setting a lot of uh, specific goals uh, in this story, uh, mainly two so far. One is, uh, I'm repeating for what I told you 10 minutes ago, one is uh, that our theories should maintain their validity even when certain uh, unsure priors turn out to be incorrect. And this should impact a different level, a visible level. And now I'm telling you, on top of that, we need to have uh, rigorous finite sample results with a finite end. And uh, again, this is, of course, uh, uh, not easy. But uh, my personal view is that uh, this is possible in many cases. So my, my optimistic message that I like to convey is uh, that uh, this can be done. So the... Um, the uh, field of statistics has been so far dealing mainly with, with, with asymptotics. Statistics is asymptotics because if you look at traditional books, so there is a lot of asymptotics. And the reason is that this uh, theta is kept the same throughout the whole story. But we look at complex uh, situations where we become greedy as we get more data points. Therefore, we need to leave this a traditional paradigm. And my message to you here is that data do contain a lot of information. And we need to strive for theories able to extract this information. And we may be successful in driving very good theories that hold true rigorously for any finite in. Now, uh, in the very last uh, a few minutes of this part of my presentation, I would like to uh, link all this to the uh, scenario approach by putting forward uh, just one concept that will become central in the second part of my presentation. So I would like uh, to uh, notice, let me change the, uh, the page. I like to notice that in many problems, uh, there is a uh, one concept that uh, stands out uh, that I would like 
to name dominance. Dominance. What do I mean by that? Dominance means that some data points are more important than others in uh, dictating the solution. So just uh, to make things concrete, uh, if you go back uh, to this example uh, where we were constructing a, a layer for a medical prediction, then the layer was uh, this one. Uh, and in this application, upon inspection, you may see that there are three data points in my uh, drawing, this, this, and this, that are at the boundary of the construction. This means that if I remove any uh, of the other data points, the solution does not change. So to say, three dictate the solution, the others have to agree. It's like uh, an uh, oligarchy emerging out of uh, a democratic election. All the others have to agree. Uh, this is extreme. I'm not saying that it is always the case. So you may want to leave out an outlier. But let's focus on the concepts. In this example, there are three dictating the solution. I call this dominance. And dominance is a concept that is often present in the designs we make. I do not have time to uh, expand this too much, but if you go to the machine learning literature, anytime you see there's a clone SVM, this is a support vector uh, machine. This includes many methodologies. Uh, support vector data description, uh, support vector regression, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, the idea of support vector is uh, really that of dominance. Some vectors, that is some data points, uh, dictate the solution. They support the solution. They, they, they determine the solution. Let alone, uh, any time you do robust optimization. Uh, optimization is a fundamental tool to do design. And robust optimization, data-driven robust optimization, goes like this. Data-driven robust uh, optimization goes like this you have various constraints, each one given by a data point. So you may have these constraints. So you want to stay, say, above uh, this line. And then you may have this. And then many more. And say that you optimize downward uh, and you want to be robust, uh, just to make things simple, with respect to all the constraints. So the solution becomes this one. Again, a uh, concept of, of dominance kicks in because uh, you have two observations uh, that are dictating the solution. If you move one of the others, the solution does not change. Now, uh, interestingly, so let me just you know touch upon a few concepts that will become more clear in the second part, uh, the concept of dominance uh, uh, connects to the concept of complexity. Complexity. Because uh, if you have uh, the dominance given by a few data points, uh, you may say my solution is uh, simple enough, at least simple in terms of the representation I can make of it uh, based on my data set. And the intuitively, low complexity implies low risk. So the concept of complexity intuitively links to the concept of risk. Now, interestingly, complexity is a measurable quantity. You find the solution 
and then you can evaluate the complexity. The risk, as said before, is not directly measurable. And the, the scenario theory is really studying, exploiting at a very deep level this connection. The connection between the two among the most fundamental and central concepts in uh, science, complexity and risk. And uh, you should, I mean, you can take home the message here that uh, the uh, scenario approach uh, is a deep methodology, is a deep methodology to connect uh, complexity to risk uh, and to evaluate the risk uh, based on complexity. And uh, it is amazing how tight these evaluations can be. And uh, I mean, you can, uh, you can really uh, develop uh, a uh, theory useful uh, in practice and also uh, very, uh, very uh, fundamental and deep uh, uh, in, the, uh, in its theoretical nature. So I'd like to stop. Uh, I spoke more than uh, expected. Uh, so this is the um, end of the first part. Uh, in the second part, I'm going to use slides uh, and to uh, enter more details for the uh, scenario approach. So we stop now.